My guest this week is Dr. Ed Ayers. From 2007 to 2015, Ed served as the ninth president of the University of Richmond, and this year became a distinguished fellow here at the University of Redlands. As a scholar, he's written multiple books about the American Civil War and has received several awards for his work. In 2013, President Obama awarded him with the National Humanities Medal for his efforts to make history more accessible. And last but definitely not least, Edda is a fellow broadcaster and co-host of the public radio show Backstory with the American History Guys. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Ed Ayers on the program. Welcome to Inside the Studio. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. So what brings you to the University of Redlands? Well, I'm, as you said, a distinguished fellow, which, which turns out to mean that I'm, uh, I taught three classes this week, or at least visited three classes. I don't know if I taught them <laughs> or not. Uh, tonight, I'm giving the Watchworn Lecture at the Lynx Shrine uh, about the Civil War, and then next week, I'm doing the Esri Forum, and I'm uh, speaking to the university's board of trustees and doing some other things as well. So they're introducing me to the broad range that is the University of Redlands. What are you speaking about at the Esri Redlands yes, Forum? It's called The Mystery of the Civil War. And uh, I think a lot of people believe that we figured that all out, and people have kind of formulaic understandings of what it was. And um, I think that we have not. Uh, and the, the fundamental mystery is how did a war that did not begin to end slavery end by destroying the largest, most powerful system of slavery in the modern world in just four years. It could not have happened, but it did. And uh, obviously Abraham Lincoln's at the center of all that, and so I'll be talking tonight about uh, some of the ways that that actually happened, which surprised people. It's, there's a saying that the most successful presidents are students of history, and so Abraham Lincoln argued in front of the Supreme Court jump forward to President Obama teaching constitutional law. Is there something to be said about the validity of that statement? Yeah, if you don't have any idea how we got here, you don't have any idea where we are. <laughs> you know, it's kind of amazing to me how people can imagine that you just sort of look around and understand where you are. And like in your own life, you're basically the, the cumulative effect of your experiences, and a country's the same. So uh, obviously, I think everybody should know a lot more history. Uh, I do think that, now I would say this, this, knowing history is not always helpful. Woodrow Wilson was a professor of history, and he showed Birth of a Nation in the White House. Uh, so it's certainly no guarantee that you're going to be enlightened, but uh, most of the time it doesn't hurt. So could you tell us about your tenure at the University uh, of Richmond as president and how that affected your career as a scholar? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, uh, so, so 27 years before that, I've been a professor uh, and dean of arts and sciences at the University of Virginia, which is about an hour away. And uh, I liked it very much, and uh, I was planning, after my six years as dean, to step back down, because I just saw the administrative thing as like a service. Uh, but they came and told me about the University of Richmond, and they tell me about a place that's uh, need-blind and meets 100% of need, and I thought... That sounds awfully good. Um, and obviously, Richmond's the former capital of the Confederacy and the center of what used to be the American slave trade. And since that's my life's work, to think about those things, I thought if you have a chance to go into an institution that's very fortunate, that my U of R, as we call it too, is, um, and do as much good as you could, that's what I was all about. So uh, we almost tripled students of color, and we doubled first generation, we doubled Pell Grant recipients. Uh, we connected with the city where we live, all of which we were not so much before. We're only about 14% in state, and um, we're 44 countries, 44 states and 75 countries at Richmond. We're about the same size as Redlands. So it's an interesting school, um, and uh, that uh, I put everything I had into basically making it as progressive as I possibly could, and we accomplished those great things. And the last thing we did before we left is we created a paid summer fellowship for every student that you can use for whatever you want to do. That's very interesting. Isn't that cool? So, wow. and, but I knew all along that I wanted to come back out the other side while I was still sentient and still uh, connect people with history. You know, getting that medal from President Obama made me think I should actually earn it. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I'm doing. And one reason I was happy to come to Redlands and, you know, do public speaking. You know, it's going to be, this is one of the largest uh, events on the Civil War in the country. Um, and so I was really honored to have a chance to do that. So, my goal all along was to have my work as a, an administrator and my work as a teacher, my work as a, a writer, and my work as a, a broadcaster uh, kind of all point in the same direction, which is trying to 
address some of the hard things from the American past and see if we couldn't do better with them in the American future. According to the National Endowment for the Humanities, you are awarded for your commitment to making our history as widely available and accessible as possible. What did that? What does that mean? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, and as possible is kind of interesting uh, clause at the end. Well, uh, I was involved in digital history from the very beginning, uh, before the World Wide Web existed, and had one of the first uh, web projects. Uh, I showed it to a class the other night, and somebody recognized that it said down at the bottom, starting in 1993, and somebody, one student said, oh, wow, that's the first year of the World Wide Web, and it was. And uh, so we built a project called The Valley of the Shadow, Two Communities in the American Civil War, and it's every piece of information about everybody black and white, male and female, soldier and civilian who lived in those two places, one in the north, one in the south. And it's been used by millions of people all around. Um, and then um, I put together a book um, for the American Library Association that was used in, um, I think, in, with 25,000 people uh, on the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. So people would come together in libraries and talk about the role of slavery and whatever. Um, and so it's things like that. You know, so I've written 10 or 11 books, and they are you know, scholarly, but they're, they're meant for a broad audience. And so um, I think that's part of it as well. So everything that I'm doing is trying to say, the subject that you think is the most boring that you've ever taken because it's just some stupid textbook is actually really interesting and important. And I'm kind of surprised by that now. I mean, <laughs> after all these years that I'm interested in history, because it's kind of the least cool thing. And yet, as you can see, I'm profoundly cool. So it's, it's just kind of a funny mix. But the whole point is that we kind of need to know this, not to memorize what the amendments are, or who vice presidents, or any of the junk we actually teach. <laughs> uh, but rather, um, how would you figure out kind of where we are? so that we can have some idea of where we might want to go. What steps do you take in order to accomplish making history more accessible? Yeah, well, making these digital projects, the one we're working on right now, and I just had the chance to visit Esri, um, and we use um, a lot of the of geographic things. We're making a, a digital atlas of American history where you can watch complex processes unfold over generations. So uh, we debuted this in December, and we were named by Slate one of the three best digital projects of the year. We're at New York Times, Gizmodo, uh, Fast Company, uh, Slate, all picked up about these things. And so we're trying to make something that's um, in a nonprofit environment, actually with undergraduate students as our main workers, uh, paid, uh, to make something that's good enough to get that kind of attention. So we've only made four maps now, and we'll make 100, so we have a way to go. Uh, but they're very complicated, very hard maps to show. So one the percentage of foreign-born in every county in the United States from 1850 to 2010, and th that's complex in and of itself, but then demonstrated in three different ways, so histograms and bubble plots and all this sort of stuff. And because everybody who lives in the United States can see themselves in this, right? And you know, the great majority of people have immigrant backgrounds from somewhere, getting some sense of how where you're from connects to the world. So basically what you'll hear me saying is... Uh, if it will connect with an audience, I'm willing to give it a shot. I was out in California uh, a couple months ago to be on a television show called Adam Ruins Everything, which began as a uh, college humor uh, video uh, show, but he got a contract uh, with True TV, and my job was to come out and ruin voting, ruin your faith in the Electoral College <laughs> and voting, and he and I time traveled back to the, uh, the Constitutional Convention, uh, and the star of that episode was the woman who was the mother in uh, Boy Meets World, which apparently people of your generation watched, which I didn't know about it. Uh, but So she's apparently somebody people admire, and she was very idealistic, and we destroyed her faith in American politics. So you know, that's the, the things that I will do. And it's all trying to talk to people in a language that's not, you know, professorial and just says, look, I've studied this junk for a long time. It's actually interesting check this out, and that's what I do. So these maps will be available for public use? They are right now. They are right now. Go to American Panorama, and you will see them right there. It's all part of the Digital Scholarship Lab at Richmond, and we've made uh, a bunch of different projects. 
Um, and our, our whole idea is to make things that we give away so that people can use them in schools, but they're also interesting if you're getting ready to say vote for President of the United States and somebody proposes you know, keeping out large numbers of immigrants to actually be able to look at this and say, what is America's history with immigration, for example? So they're meant to be a part of the public discourse, and, and um, they're we live at a time when for the we have all kinds of new tools, all these new digital things, and this is the most profound social change of our time, and I just want us to be a part of it. So we're trying to think what whatever cool thing that we can do with it. To the average American, details about events that took place centuries ago um, sometimes can seem complicated um, or hard to care about. Uh, why is it important that the average person should learn about these events and how can we as a society make this information more accessible? Yeah, I'm not really interested in details. Uh, you, you mentioned before we have this radio show, which is also a podcast. It's weekly. And one of the first things when uh, our producers came in is that we don't actually know anything. So there's three of us who, among the three of us, have taught for 100 years uh, and written these books and things. But people would say, so who was, you know, Secretary of State? And we don't know. You know, <laughs> that's what Wikipedia is for. Uh, so... That's what I'm saying, that the, the detail that we imagine that history is, is not really important. It's the big patterns. Um, so, you know, for example, I don't think that people um, have any idea of the way that the origins of people who are born outside the United States has changed from 1830 to the present. And our map, you, it, it sends out tendrils to all the places where people are from. Uh, and last night I showed it in one of the classes here, and people, oh, they just, it, and so it's that that I'm interested in. I don't really care about details. Um, I don't really care about facts. Uh, I care about getting things right. But more often than not, it's actually seeing the big patterns. That's what mapping is so good for, is that you can see something that you could not describe in words. So you you currently broadcast from the University of Virginia. Right. And it's about it's a podcast about American history. Yep. So how did you get started in radio? To yeah, begin with? that's a good question. Well, so one of the other history guys and I did a talk, and uh, the gentleman who was a producer of another show uh, at the, it's the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, based at the University of Virginia, came up and said, "Hey, have you guys ever thought about doing radio?" <laughs> no, this is two thousand five or six. No, and he says, "Do you ever listen to car talk?" We said, "Yeah." He said. We'd like for you to do car talk for history. And my friend, who's very funny, said, well, there's only two problems with that. One, we're not funny. And two, history's not funny. <laughs> but it turns out this guy's one of the funniest people I know. And, but we had no idea what that would look like, except we recruited a third friend who does the 20th century. And we came in to the studio, much like this one, and um, made several demos. Um, and then several, a, a public radio station in Virginia picked it up. And then 10 picked it up, and now we're on over 200 stations coast to coast, uh, including uh, Boston and Chicago, San Bernardino. Uh, and, um, but then the big thing that happened to us that made the biggest change is um, our young producer came in and said there's these new things called podcasts uh, that were just being developed. And he'd actually worked on them in New York. So we got in on podcasts pretty early, um, and I'm hoping in the next two or three weeks that we'll pass the 10 million mark. On That's incredible. It's Congratulations. Cool. Well, thank That's you. a huge milestone. Well, what's weird about it, you'd asked me before about being president. So here I am being president of university and trying to make a – and you can imagine what this is like. It's 55 minutes a week of original programming that involves three of us, three hosts, and pr we'll probably have – six guests, um, all of whom sometimes are historians and sometimes they're uh, real people, as we call them. Uh, and uh, so we would do it a lot. I was in my studio in, in Richmond. Everybody else is in Charlottesville about an hour away at 730 in the morning. And we would do it. And I'd try to tuck it in all the jobs I have to do as president. You see how our president council works? Well, I was too. So that we were able to do that for um, eight years seems kind of a miracle in retrospect. So I think we've, we have over 100 episodes now. And uh, they've been a lot of fun. We we performed uh, in uh, Washington D.C. at President Obama's inauguration. Uh, we've been at the Smithsonian several times. We've did a program for Chiefs of Staff of the United States Senate, uh, talk about you know partisanship in the past and stuff like that. So we did a show about beer in Milwaukee in front of several hundred people. So so we do we we're live as well as podcasts as well as radio, and uh, so. 
it's interesting to see this medium coming back among younger people. Uh, when they asked us if we were interested in 2005, we thought it was a dinosaur. You know, who could possibly care about that? But then uh, all the, our producers now uh, are young. Uh, many of them are women, and they are all much cooler than we are. Uh, and uh, they grew up on This American Life and uh, other shows like that, Radio Lab and things like that. So all three of us were not really radio people. We were teachers, um, but we kind of learned the craft along the way from these experts. How does, what role does broadcasting play in your career as a historian? Well, you know, it gives an odd, one way to think about it, um, I don't know if this is a universal phrase, reacts, uh, you know, that the three of us will get together Somebody, um, an expert, will talk to us about something, and then the three of us riff on it. And you'd have to, you have to know a whole lot of stuff to be able to say something meaningful and interesting on the fly about a different subject every week. So in many ways, it's leveraging what we've spent all these decades learning um, and to be able to make a connection among things that other people wouldn't think to make because this is what we do for a living. So we love it. It's, it's a perfect fit for what we do because it's a verbal medium uh, a, and nobody has to see us which is always welcome and the um, teaching is fundamentally verbal and writing is fundamentally words so radio is a, a good fit for us um, and it's an extension of, you know you've had a great class but out in the world it's hard to recreate that feeling of a great class uh, radio gives you the chance to do that. And so we're very plugged in to Twitter and Facebook, um, and um, people can ask us questions and suggest shows and things like that. So it's also a great extension by connecting us with an audience in a very reactive way. We have people from, we have done interviews with people in Germany and China who are Americans who are interested in American history who listen to us on, on podcasts. So being able to be asynchronous and people to be able to you know, binge listen to us and all that, uh, just it's like custom made for what we do. I imagine it would be very fulfilling to have 10 million people listen to you. Yeah, but as you know, you can't see them. Right? So it's a very abstract sort of thing. So tonight, you know, I, 340 was the, the last number I heard coming to the dinner. Uh, many ways, that's more tactile, right? But it's always an immediate response. Yeah. And uh, so the thing is, I like something each of these things does, you know. So, so the, my first book, written in 1984, is still in print. And so people come up and and they, if somebody's read a book you've written, it's like they, they've been inside your head. I point out that I was 29 when I wrote that, and they shouldn't pay any attention to it, <laughs> but, it but it's still there. So, to, you know, of all these things, teaching is the best, frankly, uh, because it's both two-way, um, but you're make, you're, it's like a jazz ensemble. You're making it up as you go along the way. But I do love using the same skills in radio and podcasting uh, to reach six or 70,000 people a week. It's, it's pretty cool. Before we go, I've just been listening to you, and I'm just, you've had a fascinating career. What are you most proud of? What's your biggest accomplishment, do you think? Oh, gosh. Um, I, don't have any, I don't know what in the world to say about that. Um, I think that um, I find everything interesting. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when I was a professor, I liked that. And then when I was dean, I liked that. And then when I was president, I liked that. And now I like the idea uh, that I could come out to Redlands and, you know, be on your show uh, at the same time that our, our podcast is out there. At the same time, people are looking at our atlas. At the same time, I'm doing a, a talk a week from tomorrow in Richmond on, on C-SPAN, you know. So it's fun to even when you're older like I am, uh, to have a chance to still be a part of what's happening. So I think, I, I, I guess I'm, if, if you boil that down to an actual answer to your question, I like the way that I've always found opportunities in whatever the world's handing me. It's a good outlook on life. Dr. Ed Ayers, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. 